Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webcast. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix. And today we have a guest presentation by Dr. Robert Hamilton of the Hospital for Sick Children. Dr. Hamilton was our second place winner in last year's Abstract Challenge. And today he will present his abstract topic surrounding the identification of cardiomyopathy genes. Dr. Hamilton, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so I'm Bob Hamilton. I'm a clinician and professor and senior so associate scientist here at uh, Sick, Sick Children's in, in Toronto. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, using uh, whole exome sequencing and, and now whole genome sequencing in distant relationships to identify cardiomyopathic genes. And let's go to the next slide, hopefully. Oh, we do have a problem. Hang on one moment and we'll see if maybe restarting this will make it behave. There we go. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, familial dilated uh, and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, and these are caused by numerous genes, um, typically um, dominant genes, and yet remain gene elusive in uh, dilated, uh, familial dilated cardiomyopathy in about 60% uh, of uh, patients or families, and in Arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, in our experience and, and the experience of the Canadian ARVC registry, remain gene elusive in about 66% of individuals or families. And when you look at any one particular gene in familial dilated cardiomyopathy, they're all uh, relatively rare, with, with the exception of perhaps uh, just a few genes, such as Titan uh, truncation variants. Dilated cardiomyopathy is, is defined as a dilated left ventricle with re reduced function and can come from many different causes. Ischemic cardiomyopathies are common amongst uh, um, elderly adults. Inflammatory and immune cardiomyopathies affect all ages. But what we're specifically going to talk about today are hereditary cardiomyopathies, which uh, in encompass about uh, between a quarter and half of, of dilated cardiomyopathies. And as mentioned, within the hereditary dilated cardiomyopathies, we have identified genes in, a, in about uh, 40%. Uh, for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, it's really defined as ventricular arrhythmias, which arise predominantly from the right ventricle in association with fibro fatty myocardial replacement, again, usually predominantly in the, identified in the right ventricle. Um, other kinds of cardiomyopathies that are recognized are hypertrophic, which in, depending on phenotype may be as much as 75% gene identified, and restrictive cardiomyopathies, which are rare. Um, Hirschberger provides a nice diagram of all the different identified genes in each of these conditions. Many of them overlap, and so you'll see many of the genes that cause dilated cardiomyopathy overlap with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, some of the genes that cause dilated cardiomyopathy overlap with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, perhaps desmoplakin being uh, one that can provide either phenotype. Um, they overlap a bit with neuromuscular so disorders and to some extent with channelopathies with perhaps sodium channel uh, being the third most common channelopathy occasionally causes dilated cardiomyopathy as well. And there's less overlap with congenital heart disease. So as an example of using whole exome sequencing um, using Golden Helix, we have this family who was uh, referred to us for research purposes from our adult uh, cardiac genetics colleagues. Um, the uh, uh, young children uh, are so to, to date unaffected, uh, but one of the fathers um, of, uh, in this family uh, was identified to have dilated cardiomyopathy, and I show the dilated cardiomyopathies here in red that are identified in this family. 
Um, and his dilated cardiomyopathy was severe enough that he required heart transplantation, as did his father and as did his, his cousin. And the purpose of showing this pedigree is really just to highlight that in dilated and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, often the youngest generation are, are uh, you know, at, at, are to, to date unaffected and so have, have not manifest the, the phenotype of the disease and it's difficult to characterize them as, as affected or unaffected. And the most senior generation have often um, died off uh, usually without sampling and thus you're really left with one or two intermediate generations um, to uh, inform your research and that really makes uh, traditional segregation uh, mapping uh, uh, just not possible in terms of identifying uh, the underlying gene or being being able to prove that a particular gene is 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 causal here or to um, help you in terms of mapping the locus. Um, there just isn't enough of an informative pedigree because you're missing the most senior generation usually and you're unable to phenotype the the, the, the youngest generation. So we've used these families to um, use uh, whole exome sequencing and now whole genome sequencing to try to identify uh, novel genetic causes, um, particularly by looking at distantly related individuals. Uh, we for a while did um, do single sequencing of patients presenting with disorders, um, but the number of variants was just uh, way too high to you know really sort out what might be causal typically we would get 500 causal variants in any one particular individual but once you have distantly related individuals then um, you know you can cut in half or in a quarter or in an eighth the number of potential causal variants and that gets down to a number which is uh, much easier to manage so let's walk through this uh, family we did whole exome sequencing on the three transplanted patients shown in the previous pedigree and uh, we identify 110 um, sequence variants in the uh, VCF files uh, that are identified across the three uh, individuals in the family. And then when we uh, narrow down to take a look at those that are common to the three affected individuals, we get down to about 8,000 variants. Uh, we then filter. You can do this the other way around. You can filter first and then take a look at, common, at, at the variants in common, but we then filter. And we typically filter at a 0 .00005 level. Now that just doesn't come out of the blue, but uh, what we did uh, for right ventricular cardiomyopathy is we looked at all of the different missense mutations that are identified and truncation muta mutations that are identified in uh, arvcdatabase.info and uh, this is a, a, an international database of uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy patients and provides a quite a long list of identified pathogenic variants in uh, up to about 12 genes but particularly of five common genes to right ventricular cardiomyopathy. We then took those um, uh, uh, variants um, uh, and assess them for uh, frequency of those particular pathogenic variants within the exome aggregation consortium uh, database and uh, that's where we get this number. Basically 90 percent of the variants in ARVC are, at a, uh, are identified in the exome aggregation consortium database at a frequency of 0 0.00005 or less and so um, this uh, is, a, is the rationale for choosing this level of filtering. And then we then go through and, um, and, and uh, identify the uh, coding variant classifications and uh, we do this basically looking for mutations at the, at the protein level. Uh, even on our current whole genome uh, sequencing, we, we typically analyze at the at the at the uh, exome level initially. And uh, indeed, you can see the um, the decreasing. Uh, I've I've um, assorted this in terms of uh, highest priority, and then in terms of the uh, the alphabetical 
So you can see that there are two uh, frame shift deletions, a frame shift insertion, a stop loss, and then uh, uh, these several nonsense uh, or non-synonymous uh, 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 variants. Um, we do see a lot of, uh, and you'll see this in the next example as well, we see a lot of Haydn variants come up no matter what we're sequencing, what the phenotype is, and this may be a problem with um, either our um, sequencing or our initial bioinformatic uh, process. Um, so we tend to just ignore those. Um, uh, but at the top of this list, you can identify uh, bag three as the as a um, frame shift deletion variant identified. And this shows the um, uh, bag three um, um, protein motifs uh, here. And uh, this is the uh, uh, variant identified uh, in uh, uh, SVS and affecting this, uh, uh, causing a deletion from this point on. And uh, this deletes the um, uh, bag motif, which uh, is an inhibitor of apoptosis and results in uh, apoptosis of cardiomyocytes and thus dilated cardiomyopathy. Now this family was clinically sequenced in 2012 and the BAG3 gene was subsequently identified as a cause for cardiomyopathy. So this is why I can present this uh, data to you today um, and thus uh, whole exome sequencing in this family came to uh, identify a known uh, cardiomyopathy gene but one that hadn't been detected uh, when they were initially sequenced in 2012. Uh, another uh, project that we've done is that of congenital junctional ectopic tachycardia. This is a fairly, uh, very rare uh, and fairly uniquely pediatric disorder of infants where they're born or identified within the first few months to have an acceleration of the junctional pacemaker, uh, the, the, basically the AV node in the center of the heart takes over as the pacemaker of the heart. And they get um, quite a significant tachycardia that then results in secondary uh, tachycardia-induced uh, cardiomyopathy. And this has been suspected to be a hereditary condition uh, for many years. Uh, Elizabeth Belaine and colleagues in France identified 26 subjects with the disorder. And within that, they found five sib pairs, all interestingly non-identical as opposed to identical twin pairs one cousin relationship and in, in one case a, a subject's father that had also had accelerated uh, junctional rhythm. Um, we collaborated with Kathy Collins um, and uh, published in 2009 99 subjects and identified a familial association in about 20% of subjects in, in that series as well. Now congenital junctional ectopic tachycardia is interesting in that um, it may look hereditary in some patients, and yet it may be related in some patients to uh, intrauterine uh, exposure as opposed to a true hereditary cause. So what happens is that these uh, mothers with uh, either predisposition or disease manifest lupus or Sjogren's syndrome as autoimmune disease generate autoantibodies. And uh, the fetus, when exposed to these autoantibodies, uh, sort of typically causes congenital heart block in the in the fetus, but sometimes perhaps as as the AV junction is um, becoming involved in the disease that would eventually will create congenital heart block and cause failure of conduction actually undergoes an increase in automaticity and so the the, the fetuses and newborns get a, a, a junctional ectopic tachycardia. And you can see in this second family that you might suspect something highly hereditary because you see one child has junctional tachycardia, the next child has junctional tachycardia, and the third child has junctional tachycardia and leading on to neonatal lupus and complete heart block. Um, but in this case, it's really just the mother who has very high anti-Rho and anti-La antibody levels that are exposing the fetus to the uh, disease-causing antibody. On the other hand, we do see families like this one that contributed to that 2009 article. This is from um, Kevin Strauss and Eric Puffenberger from the Clinic for Special Children in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. 
and this is a Lancaster Amish family where multiple individuals have junctional tachycardia and you can see it's very unlikely that that these in individuals, particularly since some of this is inherited through the mother and some of it through the father, are, are going to be exposed to um, uh, maternal antibodies. It would be uh, this individual is ostensibly unrelated to the others. And so this is a case of true hereditary junctional ectopic tachycardia, and this is the kind of case that interested in us. Um, Dr. Strauss and Pup have done SNP mapping and identified a putative locus. Um, but they've also done whole exome sequencing and have not yet identified a, a candidate, at least the last time that I was speaking uh, to them about this family. We had a similar family referred to us for research purposes by Dr. Jeff Vinicure, who's a former clinical fellow here with us and trainee. And uh, he's now on staff at Golisano Children's Hospital and referred this family to me for research purposes. Um, this uh, proband child. Uh, his uh, father, uh, uh, paternal aunt, and cousin were all affected with congenital junctional ectopic tachycardia. And following the family history back even further, the uh, paternal great-grandmother was an obligate carrier through to some other individuals on the other side of the family that were also uh, affected. And uh, this whole family drove from uh, the Rochester area to Toronto um, in several cars and on a couple of different days um, to provide research samples to us. Uh, whole exome sequencing was performed on the three samples and we chose these three, the uh, proband and uh, paternal aunt and the obligate uh, grand, uh, great grandmother and came up with uh, three uh, candidate genes and uh, we continued to uh, perform Sanger sequencing on the remainder of the individuals for these uh, three gene variants to uh, expand the segregation. And uh, this was the result of our uh, uh, assessment. We identified uh, several genes. Again, just I would just ignore the Haydn variants here. And if we do that, we come down to these several genes. Uh, which include TNNI3K, uh, GYG1, and there was a third gene that we thought was um, uh, highly likely. And as we uh, were working towards segregating the larger uh, family, unfortunately got beat to print by two good colleagues, uh, Michael Golub, uh, three good colleagues, Michael Golub, Kim Boycott, and uh, Rob Gao, who identified in a small fa smaller family through exome sequencing a mutation in the TNNI3K gene as a cause of conduction system disease. And even though it was a smaller family, there was um, a, uh, a previous report identifying cardiomyopathy in, uh, in individuals with TNNI3K mutations. So they were pretty comfortable that they had the gene. And indeed, once we finished uh, sequencing the remainder of the family, we also found the TNNI3K mutation. This is the, uh, the Ottawa family that uh, uh, Dr. Golub and Gao and the boycott identified. Uh, this mutation associated with uh, congenital junctional ectopic tachycardia uh, last uh, uh, spring. And so what is TNNI3K? It's a troponin interacting kinase. It uh, has cardiac restricted expression. It's been implicated in uh, various cardi cardiac phenotypes, including conduction disease and arrhythmias and, and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So as we went through these, it, uh, not everybody that carried our mutation uh, manifest disease, but certainly those that did not never manifest disease. So it is incompletely penetrant within our pedigree. Um, and so we're moving on to perform functional studies uh, to take a look at this gene and, and look at its implication in causing both arrhythmia and dilated cardiomyopathy. This is an example of a uh, zebrafish EKG machine that we have, and so we're creating the zebrafish. You can bring this pair of electrodes down onto the zebrafish, which has been temporary, temporarily anesthetized. Um, the fish is uh, good out of water for about uh, four to five minutes, and then you just put it back in water and it swims away. So it's a, it's a re recoverable uh, way of studying the rhythm in the fish. And we also can look at uh, function in the zebrafish. So um, all of this is uh, moving along nicely, and we should have some uh, F2 progeny to look at soon.
Um, the fish is created through a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, targeted uh, uh, gene editing approach and uh, uh, which has become uh, pretty much the routine within our core zebrafish uh, laboratory. And so we'll be looking to see whether this is a gain or loss of function and uh, hopefully screening small molecular uh, uh, libraries um, initially focused on TNNI 3K inhibitors um, but uh, also um, perhaps looking at uh, FDA approved generic drugs which we have libraries of uh, here through one of our collaborators. Um, this work is uh, being supported by the Paul Gillette Fund. Uh, Paul Gillette um, uh, passed away about uh, three years ago and was a, a leader in the pediatric and congenital electrophysiology uh, society and so uh, this has been supporting um, this work uh, by through a, a grant to uh, Dr. Zvinacure and, and Dr. Koopman, a postdoc in my lab. And the other people that are assisting on this project are Mia Fata, our, our lab manager, and Sarah Hutchin, the, Hutchinson, the zebrafish lab manager, as well as Jim Dowling, the director of our core zebrafish lab. Now just so that you don't think, uh, we always find just genes that have already been identified or get beat to print. Um, this is another family that we're uh, working on. This individual, uh, I was asked to see his children uh, by his widow. He had uh, just finished exercising um, in a uh, uh, private uh, gym had walked out into the uh, the mall and and dropped dead and could not be resuscitated. And uh, we found uh, through uh, taking a history that he had a brother, uh, uh, sorry, a cousin uh, who was uh, in Brazil and had had an exercise test, part of a regular cardiac routine for assessment of you know forty year old individuals. And uh, during the exercise test, he'd had uh, sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, just after the uh, recovery period in the exercise test, his uh, electrodes were removed, and he then went on to have an episode of um, cardiac syncope or passing out. And uh, so we were pretty confident that he likely had uh, the same disorder. Um, and then we also assessed uh, the uh, proband's uh, father and sister and identified features of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy as well. Uh, we went on to do whole exome sequencing of uh, these two individuals and um, uh, identified a gene which had been previously associated with long QT syndrome. It was one of the very rare causes of long QT syndrome. When you look at the mouse model, you'll actually identify that uh, most of the QT interval prolongation on the mouse EKG was actually related to uh, QRS prolongation. And so this was likely in both uh, the mouse model and in this family a disorder of uh, depolarization of the heart as opposed to an or a disorder of repolarization of the heart. And we're also moving ahead and making a mouse model of this uh, gene defect. Uh, sorry, a, um, a zebrafish model of this gene defect as well. And then uh, the the second arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy gene discovery family that we have is this one. Um, this uh, proband um, is a, an academic researcher from a neighboring institution and was identified with uh, a mild form of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. It wasn't really bothering him too much, but gives him abnormal um, Holter findings and and um, and he whether or not his children might be affected. Uh, one of the three children actually does show an early sign of uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, his father was uh, affected. He was identified on post mortem to have arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy with fibrofatty replacement of the heart, even though he died of different causes. And the same thing was true of his uncle and his surviving cousin also has manifestations of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So we took uh, these four individuals and again we like to include cousin relationships to try to cut back if there's a, a cut back the number of uh, possible shared variants if there's a clear phenotype in a cousin and identified a uh, another gene and uh, 
this was a gene that's never been described in human uh, in terms of any mutated mutation or disease, uh, but it has been knocked out in uh, mouse, and when you knock it out in mouse, um, gives you a uh, dilated, thin-walled uh, ventricle. And uh, so we, we're, we're quite confident that we've identified another arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy gene and are creating a zebrafish model to evaluate this further. Um, in addition to human work, we do some uh, dog work. We specifically looked at um, um, the boxer dog as it's a naturally occurring model of uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it has been in the past associated with a 3' UTR mutation in the striatin gene in American dogs, and the striatin gene sits on chromosome 17 down in kind of this region. Um, the group that identified the striatin UTR mutation uh, as being pathogenic in those dogs had a single SNP in that location and uh, identified the 3' UTR variant associated with disease in their dogs. And unfortunately, this didn't segregate uh, amongst the uh, Canadian, UK, or European dogs for which uh, we have samples. Um, they did also identify an upstream region uh, in and around this region of uh, chromosome 17, or dog chromosome 17. And uh, we also found that amongst the Canadian, UK, and European dogs. Unfortunately, um, there aren't a lot of genes in that region. And, uh, and uh, we've also done a whole exome sequencing, and these are some of the variants that are upstream or downstream from that SNP region on dog chromosome 17. So we've done uh, whole exome sequencing on eight affected and, and eight unaffected dogs, and these are some of the variants that, that we ad identified, but didn't really segregate well between the affected and unaffected dogs. So we continue to look um, at at, um, at this region uh, in the boxer dogs. And this is just a nice example of how you can use uh, golden helix for both a SNP study and exome study in the, in the same project. So um, what do I like about uh, golden helix SVS in terms of bioinformatics? I, find it provides for very easy analysis of uh, SNP data, exome data, or genome data for users like myself without a major bioinformatic background. I'm medically trained, but um, have some sort of retraining within cardiac genetics. Um, I found it relatively easy to learn, very short uh, learning curve, and part of that is uh, perhaps the excellent uh, um, support provided by the uh, Golden Helix company. Things that I like, it, it has many analyses within one program. For instance, for the, for the dog data, we, we um, uh, recognized that the dogs were all related to each other, so it had uh, programs in there for looking at um, uh, sort of GWAS analysis, but GWAS analysis of data that uh, where, where uh, subjects may be related to each other. Um, it provides for rapid implementation of any new reference data that comes out really as soon as data comes out into the public domain that's been incorporated into the, the platform within a week or two. Um, and it um, provides for a good integration uh, with a free BAM viewer as well. And so the company support has really been just amazing. And to give you just a few examples of this, a couple of weeks ago when I was putting uh, this together, I suggested some things that, that I might like to see. And so, um, you know, uh, one of, uh, one of the uh, individuals, Greta, in, in the company um, immediately responded and uh, showed me how to do these things. So one of the things I like to do if our families have multiplex pedigree uh, functions. And although uh, I had a, a difficulty because initially the way I was doing it, you had to have uh, data on all individuals in the pedigree data. Uh, Greta suggested importing the pedigree file first and then a, assigning the genotype data to the individuals for which you had um, data. Um, I wanted to see more protein level effects in the graphical portion of the program, and so Greta showed me how to apply what are called feature labels uh, from the protein coding field. 
um, in your in your spreadsheet uh, to the graphical portion of the protein uh, uh, data uh, to the graphical portion of the program to provide this protein coding data right within your graphical uh, presentation. It has uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we've uh, in one project we had was that our files were provided to us in fast Q format from another institution and it took us a couple of uh, weeks to get our bioinformatic group to uh, transfer these from fast Q to SAM to BAM to BCF formats and uh, indeed the company offered to perform these file conversions on a more expedited, uh, expedited way uh, uh, for us. One of the things I'd be interested in the group's of, uh, thoughts on is uh, the implementation of estimation of recent shared ancestry. We um, find that we have lots of samples with phenotypic, uh, phenot that are phenotypically well characterized as a, as a particular phenotype, but we don't know whether those samples come from individuals who are related to each other or not. And so implementing an estimation of recent shared ancestry might identify which individuals within a particular phenotypic pot are related to each other and thus amenable to this kind of um, assessment of distant relationships to identify new genes. So that's uh, something that I'd be interested in whether other um, groups are interested in implementing within, the, uh, within a subroutine in the, in the program. And that's uh, pretty much it for the presentation. I'd be very happy to take questions about uh, um, this work and, and how I've done it and, uh, and open to suggestions as to how to uh, evaluate these families better. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bob. Sorry for the delay there. I was having a trouble unmuting myself. Um, we will go ahead and take questions. I'll give you a couple minutes or a minute to answer or to enter those in. Um, just a couple of quick announcements from me. Um, of course, I'm recording the webcast and I will have that to everyone via email um, so you can watch it again or pass it along um, on Friday. So look for those in your inbox. Um, our next webcast is coming up on the 13th of July, and I'm still finalizing the details and invitations will come out in the next few weeks, so look for those. Um, and at this point, I'm not seeing any questions, so we can go ahead and wrap for today. Feel free to drop us a line at info at goldenhelix.com if you do have questions, and I can get them to Dr. Hamilton. Um, Bob, thanks so much for an excellent presentation. Okay, thanks very much. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you next time.